Thanks everyone for coming. Um, who else was at two o'clock at Tech Talk 42 and crashed the Girl Scout party there that was there? <laughs> One, two, yeah. Sorry for this, there, there was just some misunderstanding with the rooms. Um, so yeah, today we have Gerard here talking about um, uh, unit testing or testing in general, test patterns and test smells. Um, I mean, you, you see the book, it's fairly heavy. Um, <laughs> It's actually funny, like, I think it's three years ago that Girard mentioned to me the first time that he's working on a book. And we usually meet each other once a year at an Agile conference. And every year after that we met, it was like, oh, yeah, I'm still working on the book, but it's actually twice as heavy as it was before. <laughs> and so I'm happy that he, that he finished now because we had 20 boxes or something carried downstairs here with the books a year later, and we couldn't have done it any longer. So <laughs> that I want to hand it over to Girard and to talk about unit testing. All right, thank you. Oh, and stop. One thing, I always forget this. This talk will be um, made available externally on YouTube. So any questions, any discussion that you have, please remember, don't talk about confidential stuff. All right, well, thanks for the introduction, Mark. Um, yeah, Mark sat in on uh, my uh, unit testing tutorial at the Agile conference. I think it was two years ago, wasn't it? And uh, so the material was already fairly, fairly well developed at that point, and you know, the last year was just spent getting it actually you know, copy edited and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, I apologize in advance for the size of the book. Um, it's a classic example of what happens when you don't get frequent feedback. And uh, the publication industry is still a little bit behind in terms of, you know, rapid deployment and getting feedback, etc. So it wasn't until I actually received the, uh, the PDFs of the page proofs, which is like two months before it goes to the printers, that I realized that it was 900 pages. Till then, I thought it was 600 pages, and just you know, when they pour it into the style, it uh, it grows a little bit. So uh, that's just a good good example of the value of feedback, which is really what unit testing is all about. Um, so what I wanted to talk about very quickly today is uh, just uh, some stuff about unit testing and feedback uh, on your both the behavior of your system that you're testing, and also some feedback that you can get on your tests themselves by looking for various kinds of smells in your tests. Now, so I'm going to sort of talk very quickly a little bit about some of the motivation behind the, uh, why we're doing the testing and why we're automating it. And then the bulk of the talk will be about code smells and behavior smells. And this is a, sort of a third order condensation because it's, uh, it's, this is like a one hour condensation of a three hour tutorial I give at conferences, which is itself a condensation of a two day course, which is itself a condensation of uh, 900 pages. So uh, we'll go fairly quickly through some of these things just so we get a sampling of some of the uh, breadth of, of things. So why do we need to test? Well, software being is a rather complex activity writing software. And there's a lot of details that we need to get right. Computers aren't very forgiving, uh, not nearly as forgiving as people. And a large part of software is about getting these details right, and a large part of it is sort of communication between the people writing the software and whoever it is is uh, telling us what that they actually want built. So there's a lot of things that could go wrong. I mean, there's lots of things that can go wrong technically. We're all humans. Humans make mistakes. Um, we make little mistakes in, uh, in how we code the software, lots of possibilities there. And some of these things will be caught by our tools and some of them won't be. Just like, you know, spell checker won't tell you that your grammar is wrong, that you use the wrong version of the word there or something like that. And also there's a lot of things that can go wrong communication-wise on our projects in terms of, you know, what does the customer really want? So lots of opportunities to go wrong. So the question is, how do we consistently deliver high quality software that people find useful? And over the years, we've developed all sorts of tools to try and do this, things like tools for capturing requirements better, designing tools, modeling tools, higher level programming languages, syntax checkers, semantic checkers, all sorts of stuff like that. But none of these things is really a substitute for actually trying out the software and making sure that it works. When we're trying software out, um, there's different ways we can do this. Unit testing is something that we do. Some people would call this uh, debugging. Some people call it unit testing. Depends on what you're, why you're doing it. Um, if you know there's lots of bugs in there and you know you have to find them, then it's debugging. Um, and 
We can do this kind of testing several different ways. One of the ways we can do it is doing things at the unit level, so making sure our little piece of software works well before we integrate it with uh, the rest of the software. And then there's, of course, the testing of making sure that the software as a whole functions. And people would call this functional testing, customer testing, acceptance testing. There's a whole bunch of different names it goes by. But it's basically testing the whole system altogether rather than the individual components. And, of course, we can do all this manually. That's the, sort of the more traditional way of doing things. And more recently, you know, people have been pushing the envelope about how to do a lot of this stuff uh, so that we can execute it automatically. The problem with manual testing, of course, is not very repeatable. Most of us uh, aren't very good at remembering exactly how we tested a piece of software that we tested today, yesterday. If there's been a long weekend involved, of course, our memory diminishes somewhat further. And six months from now, we're going to be pretty hard-pressed to repeat the testing, even if we had the time and we're prepared to put the effort into retesting everything completely after we'd uh, made some changes to the software. So that's one problem. And the other problem is the whole communication side of things. What should a soft piece of software do? If it no longer does what it should do, how can you tell what it was supposed to do? You know, the common answer is, well, you read the code and find out what it's supposed to do. But if it's not doing what it's supposed to do, how can the code possibly tell you what it was supposed to do? And that's one of the areas where tests come in is they help describe what the code should have done now that it doesn't. And so it's communicating through time, if you will, into the future to someone who has to maintain this piece of code that, uh, that you wrote, what the software was intended to do when it was written, as opposed to what it actually does now that something has changed in the world. So one solution to all this, of course, is automated testing. Let me just unplug the wireless card there so that we don't get any more of those. So why automate tests? Well, my example of the book publishing problem, lack of feedback. Automated testing gives us very rapid feedback. If we can have our tests run every time we change the code, then we get rapid feedback on our software and how we're doing. And then the question becomes, how do we find the bugs? How do we know where they are? Well, if we get the feedback very rapidly, we know exactly where the bugs are because we just put them in 10 minutes ago. And that's a much easier problem to solve than to find the bugs that were put in weeks ago uh, you know, through a, series, a long series of changes. So it actually makes finding the, the problems debugging a lot quicker if we have the automated tests running very frequently. This is one of the fundamental concepts in Lean, is that we want to avoid waste. And the whole idea of putting defects in and then taking them back out again, spending effort to take them out, is a classic example of the kind of waste that Lean production systems strive to remove. And so this is one of the quotes from Shea Gosingo, who's one of the, sort of the big Lean guys who came up with the Toyota production system, is inspection to find defects is waste. Infections to prevent defects is essential. Automated unit tests, when written before the software is actually even built, are an excellent example of in-process inspections to avoid inserting defects. So you can think of, of unit tests as being defect prevention or bug prevention, bug repellent, if you want to think of it that way. The approach that we use to automated unit testing is an approach I call scripted tests as opposed to the recorded tests that a lot of the UI testing tools use. And uh, we do it using things like uh, various members of the X unit family. Um, you can also do it in some other things like, for example, the water framework for Ruby. You can do sort of more full system testing that way. Or you can focus at the unit test level um, for testing individual classes and methods. So what does it take to be successful at automating unit tests and having these unit tests help you keep your software soft, to keep the software malleable, because that's really why we're writing all these unit tests. Well, writing tests is a form of programming, so you need some programming experience. XUnit framework is pretty simple, but you need to understand how to use it. And of course, none of this is useful if you don't know what are the right tests to come up with. So you need a little bit of testing experience. These are all things that are fairly easy to come by given you know, a little bit of time. Does this lead us to robust automated tests? And the answer is, unfortunately, no. So the next question is, what do we need to do? And specifically, why do we need unit tests and component tests as opposed to just system tests? And the problem is that the system tests will tell us that there is a problem. 
But then we have to start digging to find out where the problem came from, which piece of code is incorrect, providing the wrong results. Component tests will help us zoom in and discover exactly which component the problem is occurring in, because we should have a component test failing in that component. And unit tests will tell us exactly which class or method isn't providing the same results as it used to. So one of the things that we find is that when you have a good set of unit tests, you always know exactly where the problem is that you inserted, because it'll pretty much narrow things down to an individual uh, method of a, of a class. So whenever you have a system test of some sort failing, you should also have a unit test failing. If you don't, then you really have a missing unit test. And that's one of the, uh, one of the sort of the more project smells that, uh, that we look for. So you'll hear me refer to various parts of, uh, of the sort of the testing uh, infrastructure in terms of the test. Then there's the system under test is whatever software that we are testing, sometimes called a SUT. Some people call it the cut or the class under test or the object under test, the out. These are all basically referring to the same thing. And sometimes we care very much about what that piece of software depends on because very few pieces of software are completely standalone. And you've probably heard of black box testing versus white box testing. In the style of unit testing that most of us do, it's all black box. But it's the question is how big is the black box? When you're testing an individual class or method, you should be writing black box tests for that one class or method. And the reason you want to write black box tests is so that if you need to change the implementation as part of a refactoring exercise, you don't have to change the test because the software should still do the same thing. How it does it might be a little bit different, but it would be uh, providing the same functionality. So it's a good example of sort of the idea of design by contract. What is the contract that this uh, component is trying to satisfy? So as we're writing tests, what are we trying to achieve with these tests? Well, before we write the code, we want the test to act as a specification for what done looks like. When I'm finished writing this piece of code, here's what the behavior should look like. So test as specification. After the code is written, the test act as documentation of how the software was supposed to behave when the test fails. It tells us, this is what it should have done, here's what it's doing now. It's different. Tests as safety net is another objective, which is basically rapidly tell us that something's gone wrong. So when we're doing some you know, interesting refactoring to try and improve the structure of the software, very quickly get told that, hey, you just changed the behavior of something, because the refactoring shouldn't change the behavior. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, defect localization. In other words, finding, telling you where the problem is so you don't spend a lot of time in a debugger. And then sort of the whole this isn't one of the objectives per se of writing the automated tests, but something we need to achieve given that we have a bunch of automated tests is we want to minimize the cost of having all these tests there. So the tests need to be fully automated, meaning you don't have to do anything manual to run them, no manual setup or no manual inspection of the results. The tests need to be repeatable, that is you can run them more than once, and they need to be robust so that over time the tests continue to provide the same results. So, a sobering thought. In my experience, well done automated unit tests, you have at least as much test code as production code. That sounds like a lot. And so the question is, how do you make sure that all this test code doesn't double the cost of writing your software? Because now you've got twice as much software. So, if you think in terms of your economic payback, if you're doing uh, development and this is what it costs you to build something over time without test automation, adding test automation is going to introduce some extra costs. And there's a big hump here where we are uh, learning stuff. I don't know if that's going to show up well on the video, but uh, that hump there is the learning curve. And after you've learned some stuff, you know, the cost comes back down. And what we're looking for is to make sure that we save at least as much effort on the you know, on the ongoing state. So that's, that's sort of, you know, the, the economic payback is that we've saved effort through debugging, the avoided, et cetera, um, to compensate for the cost of writing these tests. If it turns out we don't save as much effort because it's expensive to run the tests or that we need to spend more time and effort maintaining the tests over time, we may find that the ongoing effort is more than it would have cost us than if we didn't have the tests at all. And that's something we want to avoid because 
you're going to be saying, well, gee, why should we be putting all this effort into maintaining these tests if they're actually costing us? The tests should be helping us go faster and maintain quality, not slowing us down. So a lot of what I'm talking about here and in the book is about what are the techniques that we can use to ensure that this happens, that the ongoing cost stays lower, the net cost is lower when you've got the automated tests. So let's talk about some of these things. What are the symptoms that we uh, will see? A lot of you have probably heard about the concept of code smells. Um, Brian Foote likes to uh, talk about the analogy, you know, with when you've got wine snobs, you know, and they're swirling their glass and sniffing, ah, oh, there's a hint of strawberry and uh, a little bit of grass. You know, well, when we're talking about, uh, about code smells, well, hmm, there's a bit of duplicated code here and some hard-coded values. Same kind of idea. And so what the smells are is they're symptoms that we observe in the code or in the behavior of our tests that tell us there's something we should pay attention to here. And the analogy comes from originally the uh, Martin Fowler's refactoring book, where he tells a little story which is attributed to Kent Beck, which is when he had his first kid, asking Grandma Beck, how do I know it's time to change the diaper? And her response was, if it stinks, change it. And that's what we're talking about here with code. If the code stinks, the odds are you need to do something about it. So a smell is the thing that grabs you by the nose. It's, the, it's whatever you actually observe in the code or see in the behavior of the test. And then we do a root cause analysis to ask, why is this happening? And uh, you may have several different root causes for the same smell, and some smells have many different uh, root causes. Some root causes may indicate several smells. So, I classify smells in tests in three categories. One is the obvious one of code smells. So this is smells that you see when you're looking at test code. Behavior smells are tests behaving badly. You're running tests and something is happening that's not being very helpful in terms of understanding what's going wrong. And I'll show some examples of these, of uh, what it looks like when you've got some of these behavior smells. And at the third level, at the project level, Project managers and customers may also detect some smells in terms of uh, things. And I don't have time to go into that today. I just mentioned them in passing. The, the uh, interesting thing here is that these smells are related and that the code smells are often one set of symptoms that may also be cor are corroborated by uh, behavior smells. And you may also see project smells as uh, all related to each other, all being traced back to the same root cause. So you actually have several opportunities to detect the same problem. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with patterns, um, the idea of a you know, recurring problem to a recurring solution, usually independently in, um, invented by a number of people. And someone like me comes along and says, well, I've heard about it from these people, and I've heard about it here, and I did the same thing. Oh, three examples makes a pattern, and you know, writes it down. And so that's largely what my book has been about, is taking these you know, well-known practices that people were doing on various projects with automated testing, and writing them down and giving them some name, trying to find consensus in the community about what's the right way to describe this particular way of doing automated testing. So test patterns is specifically the idea of applying patterns to test code. And a good example of a test pattern would be a mock object. In my book, I sort of classify the uh, test patterns at a number of different levels. We've got high-level automation strategy patterns like recorded tests versus scripted tests. We've got more detailed design patterns like implicit setup of fixtures versus delegated setup. There's patterns around how do you code certain things like assertion methods and creation methods. And then you get all the way down to language-specific idioms um, about how you do certain kinds of tests like expected exception tests are done quite differently in languages with blocks the languages that don't have blocks. So let's look at some examples for code smells. So you'd notice that you have a code smell when you're looking at tests, and the tests are hard to understand. The tests may contain coding errors that may result in things like missed bugs or erratic tests, which is one of the behavior smells that I'll give an example of a bit further down. Or you may find that tests are very difficult to write, or maybe even impossible to write, because the right design for testability isn't present in the code that you're trying to test. Maybe you can't 
invoke the functionality directly. Maybe you can't instantiate the object you're trying to test. Maybe you can't get it into the right initial state or you can't observe the, uh, the resulting state after your test is executed. So these are all examples of symptoms that might tell you that you have a code smell here. So some common code smells are things like conditional test logic and tests, um, hard to test code, obscure tests, test code duplication, test logic in production, and so on. So let's look at a little example. This is sort of the classic example of invoices with addresses and customers and that kind of stuff on them. Let's look at what a test might look like. And this kind of test is pretty typical when I get involved in a project and people have been you know, learning how to do automated uh, unit tests and they're trying to get some t existing code under test, they might end up with a test that looks something like this. And I mean, you may have trouble reading this, especially uh, on the recording, because there's just an awful lot of lines of code on this test. It's about 35 lines of code, and that's way too much code in a single unit test. So let's break this down a little bit and focus on different parts of the test, and let's go looking for some test smells. So here's the uh, middle part of that test, which is actually verifying the outcome. There's a bunch of code here that is looking at various aspects of the invoice that we uh, have created here and looking at things. So let's look at some things. What's wrong with this test? Well, here down here at the bottom, we've got this assert true false. Now, anyone who's used uh, JUnit a fair bit probably realizes that that's kind of a strange statement. I mean, you're supposed to have a conditional expression in there on the assertion, and here we got a constant. So this test, this assertion will always fail. So a very simple refactoring of this obtuse assertion is to replace it with an assertion that's a little bit more intent revealing. Let's just say fail. That's a, a much better way of saying exactly the same thing. Now this actually belies a larger problem, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, first, we see a bunch of hard-coded constants here in our tests. And there's probably some relationship between these numbers and some numbers earlier in the test, but what is that relationship? Someone's done the math in their head, typed the result into the system, so the person reading this test six months from now doesn't understand the business rules. They're not evident in this test. The other problem with hardwired test data is it can lead to fragile tests when, the, when these values are used as unique keys in databases and so on. So what could we do? Well, one thing we could do is compare all these expected values with expected values that were, the actual values with expected values that were calculated. And here we don't see them being calculated because we're only looking at one part of the test. But one of the things that this points out is we have a large number of assertions and we're comparing field by field two different objects, an expected object and an actual object. And why do we need to compare them field by field? This test is too verbose. And if I've got half a dozen tests and they're all doing these same six assertions in each one, I've got a lot of duplicated test logic. So why don't I factor that out using a simple extract method and have a simple assertion here? Now I could just boil this down to an assert equals, but there may have been a reason I was comparing those six fields because there were a bunch of fields I didn't want to compare. And that's an example of test specific equality. There may be fields that are don't cares and I want to make sure that I don't compare them. Or it could be that object equality is not what I'm looking for. I'm only looking for equivalence, not equality. So, in this case, I've introduced a custom assertion, which is an assertion method that I wrote. Nothing says that only the creators of JUnit can, uh, can write assertions. Everyone can write assertions. Whatever makes your code easy to understand, whatever expresses your intent well. So here, assert line items equal, takes two line items, it behaves just like assert equal, except that it has logic in it that compares two line items with what we care about in this test. Makes our test a lot simpler. That lets us boil the test down a bit more here, and now we can see some more interesting things in this bit of assertion logic. So the next thing we'll notice here is we've got an if statement in our test. Now, remember I said the trick is to try and keep from having the doubling of our code base, because we've got as much test code as production code, from increasing the cost of our tests. And one of the ways that we avoid that is by not having any conditional logic in our test methods. The problem with conditional logic is you're not quite sure what you're testing. And it's a slippery slope once you start introducing any conditional logic in the, into the body of the test method, whether 
you're actually testing in potentially different circumstances because you don't have enough control over your test fixture or whether you're just dealing with different cases of things that the system might have done instead. It's a lot better to be very declarative in your tests. And in fact, in this case, it's very easy to replace this if statement with a guard assertion. So instead of saying if this, do this asserting, otherwise do this other asserting, or just fail in our case, we can say assert equals, make sure the number of items is one. If the item, number of items is not one, then we don't proceed on to the assertion of the, uh, the line items. So here we've reduced the amount of code it takes to verify that the outcome has occurred, what the outcome should be, you know, from eight or ten lines to just a, a few lines. So significant compaction. So let's go look at another part of the test here. So that was the part where we verified the outcome. Let's look at this stuff at the bottom here. Sorry, before I go ahead. The stuff at the bottom of this uh, picture, this finally clause, what's that doing there? So we do this try, do some stuff, including verifying the outcome, and then we do a finally. And in the finally, we're doing some delete objects. We delete the expected line item, we delete the invoice, the product, etc. So what's wrong with this code? Why did we need the finally? And is this actually doing what we think it should be doing? So the reason the finally is there is because when a test fails, assert throws an exception. And if we just did the assert and then we did this cleanup logic, then the cleanup logic would never run. Which gives us a hint as to what's wrong with this cleanup logic, other than the fact that we actually have cleanup logic, which I'll get to in a minute is that assuming we did get to this finally, something went wrong. Now, is there any guarantee that nothing else will go wrong here? What happens if delete object expected line item fails? Will we delete our invoice and our product, et cetera? Probably not. And what that would lead to is when we're running other tests or the same test at a future time, we may have leftover stuff lying around. Think of it as test data object leakage. Sort of like memory leakage, it's just as insidious. You don't know when it happened. When you detect it, it's way too late to figure out how it happened. And so you really want to try and avoid this. So if you're trying to do uh, cleanup in a less naive way, you would have to make sure that you do a dry finally around each of these. And that starts getting really ugly. And you thought that the, the code was, was very verbose before and hard to get right. Well, this just made it even harder. So it's better to try and avoid this problem entirely. So one option is to move all of this out of the test method into the setup, into the teardown method on the test case class, which at least puts it into one place, so then you have to write it once, but then it has to be a bit more generic because it needs to handle the situation for any of the tests on that class. But you still need the nested try finallys there. You only get rid of one layer because the teardown method is a essentially a finally on your test case class because it gets run after every test method, whether they pass or fail. Better solution is to not deal with this on a test-by-test -test basis, but rather build a generic mechanism to keep track of any test objects that you have to delete at the end of tests. And something simple like having a call to add test object, which adds it to a collection, which you can then later iterate over uh, and have unit tested that delete all test objects method that we see at the bottom to make sure it really works in all the circumstances. This is a better solution if you really need to have teardown logic in your tests. But having the teardown logic itself is a smell because that implies that you have some kind of persistence going on in your tests. And except for tests that are testing your persistence mechanism, you really should try and test all your business logic with no persistence layer present. In other words, testing the objects purely in memory. And that forces you to think in terms of design for testability of having clean separation between your business logic and your persistence logic which is a, a, a very good thing for a bunch of other reasons as well. So assuming you've done one of these, all of our test logic, all of our teardown logic disappears from our test. So that makes our test a little bit uh, more compact and now we're down to the point where we can almost read the whole test sitting and looking at it uh, on the screen here. But there's still lots that we can do here to make this test better. So what else? Let's look at this front part of the test here, which is the fixture setup. So here we have a bunch of calls to create some objects. 
So we're creating a couple of addresses, we're creating a customer, we're creating a product, and an invoice. In here, we're seeing all sorts of hard-coded test data. And that may lead to unrepeatable tests if that data is in any way required to be unique, um, especially if I start cloning the same fixture setup from one test to another, and if there's any persistence involved. But it just makes this test hard to understand. What is all this stuff doing here? What are we actually testing? Well, let's look at the name of that method, test add item quantity. So it seems to be something to do with this method at the bottom here of add item quantity to this invoice for a particular product and quantity. So what's all this address stuff got to do with adding items? Now, one of the principles here is if it's not important for it to be in the test, it's important for it not to be in the test. So one of the ways of saying that the stuff's not important is instead of using literal values, just generate some values. And you know, so here we're calling a method get unique string. So we're just getting some string and including it as a value. That at least lets the reader know that it wasn't important to the outcome. But we can go one step farther and say to ourselves, well, if this stuff is going to be just generated and unique, do I even need to have it? If it's irrelevant information, let's see if we can get it out of the test entirely. So let's just remove all the stuff from our test and see what we end up with. So we can use the concept of a creation method. So instead of using the native object constructors, because that's what we happen to have, which take all these arguments, we can hide that behind a test object factory, which may be our, our own test case class, and have these methods, create anonymous address, which says, just give me an address, I really don't care about it, that what it contains, I just need an address, because later on here, I'm gonna use that address as an argument for my customers. So our test is a little bit more compact now. So now we can start working on our test while looking at all of it at the same time. So looking again here at our two calls to create an anonymous address, why do we need to create these addresses? Well, it's because we need them as arguments to create customer. Why do we need to create a customer? Well, we need it as an argument for the invoice. Well, okay. Do we really need to create these anonymous addresses in every test where we need to create a customer? Probably not. So why don't we factor out that irrelevant information and hide that behind a simpler version of create anonymous customer. I need a customer, I don't care anything about this customer, nothing's important about it, I just need one. So we hide that behind this uh, creation method. We can even go one step farther and say, why did I need the customer? It's because I needed it for the invoice constructor. Okay, well let's create a, a factory object for the, uh, for the invoice and have it create the customer for us. If it wasn't important to be in the test, it's important for it not to be in the test. So now we've reduced our fixture setup from a dozen lines of code to just a couple. And it's just the essential objects that are needed for that one method that we're testing. So now let's go back to the bottom of our test here and take a look at some of this code. Now that we've simplified the rest of the test, you know, we can sort of see where there's still some stuff that looks a little bit unnecessary. So what's all this code doing down here? We're asserting, we've got a, we're getting the line items from the invoice, we're asserting that there's one of them, and then we're uh, getting the first one, the one at position zero, and then we're asserting the line items are equal. What are we doing there in plain English? What we're really doing here is saying there should be exactly one line item and it should look like this. So why don't we say that directly? So by creating yet another custom assertion, we can say ex assert exactly one line item. And here's the expected line item. So we've gone from something like 35 lines of code in this test method to five lines, five executable lines of code. So that's a pretty severe compaction on this test. So when we look at our test method, our test class, and look at all the methods on that test class, we can see what we're testing here. So we've got, you know, test add item quantity, one item, several items, duplicate product, zero quantity, et cetera. So we've got now here a nice list of test conditions. So let's quickly zoom into one of these other test methods to see now that we've built this little infrastructure of, of factory methods and custom assertions, et cetera, what does this do to how quickly we can write a test? 
Ask yourself, how long would it have taken to write that 35-line test method? And if we say, look at several items here, how long will it take to write that? Well, we have to add another product because we're going to test here creating a, an invoice with two pr different products on it. So we add, an, sorry, we add another product. We call add item quantity twice. We create another expected line item. And now we assert exactly two line items on this invoice. And so this, this test I actually wrote on the phone while talking with a, with a coworker. We were doing this presentation a long, long time ago for an Agile users group meeting. We said, oh, we should show what, it, what the, a new test would look like. And so well, let me just code that up. And while we're on the phone, I wrote this test in 30 seconds. Now, that's an incredible productivity improvement in terms of writing tests. And it's enabled by having all these utility methods that we've created in the course of refactoring this one big test. Now you can get here either by refactoring from big ugly tests or you can start out by saying to yourself as you are writing, what am I really trying to test here? And instead of focusing on what you have available in terms of methods that you can call, work outside in and create the methods that don't even exist yet. Type in your test the way you want it to look and then use your IDE to help you fill in the bodies of those, of those methods. And so you're actually driving the test infrastructure from your test. And you could write half a dozen of these tests before you even bother to fill in an implementation for assert exactly two line items. The other thing you want to try and avoid when doing this kind of stuff is avoid overgeneralizing. Do you need to be able to compare three line items, five line items, et cetera? Which is actually a much harder problem than comparing two. And so what are the cases you need to cover? There are no line items, there's exactly one line item, and there's two. Once you've got two, it really doesn't add any value to do three items, four items, et cetera. So it's actually much simpler to write exactly two line items than to do even three. So that brings us to the end of the code smell section. That's just a sampler. There's lots more code smells. But I wanted to get to behavior smells. And behavior smells are problems that we see when we're running tests. And the problem could be that the tests are passing when they should fail or fail when they sh should be passing. Um, and the problem could be that the tests are coded wrong. The root cause could be that the tests are coded wrong or there's something wrong with the system under test itself. So let's look at a very short list of them here. Uh, things like slow tests are a problem. Tests that are erratic, and there's a lot of different reasons for them being erratic. Tests that are fragile. Let's look at a, an example here of what we're talking about when we talk about slow tests. One of the things that I mentioned early on is it's good to have rapid feedback. And when we're building functionality, we want to get feedback on the functionality that we've built. We're editing the code on a regular basis. And every time we edit the code, we could introduce defects. And we should be doing some kind of regular continuous integration build or daily build or something. So each of these times, it's important for us to be able to build and run our tests very quickly. If it takes us too long to run our tests, we will run them less often. If we run them less often, we get feedback less, regu less regularly, which means we've introduced more defects between when we introduced them and when we finally got around to running the tests and finding them, which means we'll now do a lot more debugging. So it's really critical to run our tests frequently, which means they need to run fast. So if we've got tests that are running slowly, we're going to find that there's a lot of pressure to make them run faster. And there's a bunch of different ways to avoid slow tests. Things like you know, get yourself some faster hardware or avoid calling slow code, like avoid the database, uh, fake out the database when you're running your tests, and so on. Or you can run fewer tests. These are all legitimate ways of doing things. One of the ways that you want to try and avoid is to use a shared fixture. Setting up a fixture once and using it across many tests is a false economy because that leads to a bunch of problems, other smells. And a good example of these smells, and I'm just going to skip over the shared fixture stuff here because it's just you know, fairly standard uh, ways of setting things up. So I really want to talk here about the symptoms that you're going to see. Erratic tests is when you're running your tests and they're giving you different results at different times. And so if you're running your tests here, and you've got a test that accesses an object, and this is a shared object, and the next test comes along and updates a value on that object. 
say the value of A changes it from 5 to 99. Another test comes along and looks at, and it's expecting 99 because it usually runs after the second test. If it turns out that the second test failed and didn't update it from 5 to 99, the last test here, which expected it to be 99, will also fail because the fixture isn't set up correctly. So there's nothing wrong with the code. What's wrong is that this fit test depends on another test to have run successfully before it. If you try and run this test by itself, it'll probably fail. I know that gets in the way of trying to debug, you know, if you want to run just one test and you can't run it by itself. Another example of an erratic test is an unrepeatable test. Same basic scenario. The first test reads fi 5. The second test updates it to 99. Third test reads 99. Now we run the same test suite again. If the fixture persists from one test run to the next, for example, a database, test number one reads it expecting a value of 5. What it finds instead is 99, so now it fails. And you can get this situation where the first time you run your tests, some of the tests fail, and then subsequent runs they pass, or you could get the opposite. They pass the first time and they fail in subsequent times. If you've got both kinds of tests in the same test suite, you got the pass, fail, fail kind and the fail, pass, pass kind, what you actually see is the first time you run the test, test number three fails, and the second time you run your test, test number five fails. And it looks like the failures are moving around, which is really disconcerting. Which is the same symptoms that you see when you have a test run war. A test run war is when you actually share a persistent resource like a database among several test runners. And if you're running these tests simultaneously, you can actually have interactions going on between the test suites being run, the same test suite being run simultaneously on different machines, for example. And you get these random, and these really are random failures because it all depends on when you run your tests. The really insidious thing about this is this problem happens more when you're coming to a deadline. And, and this isn't just Murphy's Law, this is a real fact that what happens is when you're writing new functionality, you only check in you know, once every few hours or few days. When you're fixing bugs, you might be ch checking in every 30 minutes after you find a bug, fix it, check it in. So you, more people are running the tests, they're running them more frequently, and therefore the odds of actually colliding in these test runs goes up. And so it, the only way to really solve this is to get everyone to stop, you know, have a token. Say, I've got the token, no one else run any tests until I finish running them. Okay, mine ran clean, okay, now you can, you can run your tests. So this is a really nasty situation that you want to try and avoid. There's half a dozen different root causes of erratic tests. There, it's complicated enough that in the book I've got an actual flow chart to go through and ask a bunch of questions to figure out which variation it is. The ultimate solution for avoiding erratic test is to use a fresh fixture. And a fresh fixture is a fixture that you build in the test and you throw away when the test is done. So each fixture gets used exactly once. Uh, a synonym for the shared fixture is a stale fixture. It's a fixture that's been used. It's uh, previously owned, if you will, right? Someone else has had this fixture. They've mucked with it. You don't know what the state of that fixture is. So as a rule, you really want to avoid reusing fixtures across tests, and especially across test runs, because it creates all these erratic behaviors that will just get you into trouble. If you really have to use a shared fixture, one option is to use an immutable shared fixture. In other words, build a bunch of reference objects and make sure none of your tests touch them. And then any objects that you do plan to either modify or delete, create them fresh in the tests. But maybe these other objects that you have are needed to be there to be referenced from the object that you're testing. And if you do need to do a shared fixture, make sure you build it in a yeah, new version of it in each test run. Otherwise, you'll end up with all these repeatable test problems. Another prop, co um, common behavior smell is fragile tests. So tests that worked yesterday, but they stopped working today. You changed something. And these are, there's four variations of it. Interface sensitivity, which is the API or the user interface you're using is changed. Behavior sensitivity is when the logic underneath changed. And of course, you expect tests to fail when you change the behavior, but the question is how many tests are failing? If tests that don't test that behavior are failing, what that implies is that you're using that behavior to set the state of the system for some other starting point of some other tests. And you really should have a way of getting the system into that state without having to exercise all the behavior to get there. 
So it's a good idea to try and encapsulate a lot of that from your test so that you don't have a lot of that logic duplicated from test to test. Uh, two other causes of fragile tests are data sensitivity. If the tests depend on what kind of data is in a database and that data changes. And this most commonly happens when a whole bunch of tests use a common sort of standard definition of, uh, of the database. And then someone changes that standard definition to add more tests, but accidentally breaks some of the existing tests. And these are all avoided by, uh, by using fresh fixtures, where you build a custom fixture for every test every time you run it. And context sensitive is when something outside the control of the system under test changes. For example, if your test, if the logic you're testing depends on time or date, and you're using the real system clock in your system, and you have no way of stubbing it out and controlling it from your test, you will have context sensitivity. You're guaranteed that at some point your tests will fail because you're in a month with a different number of days in it, or a leap year, or who knows what. So to avoid interface sensitivity, we can make sure we use stable interfaces or we can encapsulate the API from our tests. Um, there's techniques for avoiding uh, data and context sensitivity around using fresh fixtures and test stubs. And the last smell I'm going to mention is hard to test code because uh, we're just about out of time. And uh, here the issue is that you're trying to write a test and the test is either very difficult to write because the right functionality isn't available for testing or you're reading tests and the problem is you can't figure out what the test is doing because it's sort of going through convoluted paths, testing the software indirectly, um, or you know, other things that, it, that you just can't get to the stuff that you're trying to test. There's uh, uh, one of the chapters in the book is dedicated to test doubles. One of the problems I ran into on project after project is people were, were using uh, different terminology to describe the same behavior of test doubles or the same terminology to describe a totally different set of behaviors. So one of the things that I tried to do is to be very clear around what are the different kinds of test doubles so we distinguish between things like mock objects versus test stubs and test spies. Um, and I won't go into any more detail on that right now just because we're out of time. But um, that's, uh, it's very important from a perspective of communicating amongst members of the development team of when you're talking about how you're going to test something is which variation that you're using so that everyone is clear as how to go about building those particular test doubles. And just to wrap things up, hopefully this has given you a small sense of what are the different kinds of test smells that you might want to look for and what are the different root causes some of those smells might have. This, remember, the smells are the symptoms that you see, and so the root causes are, you know, you ask, why are we getting this smell? Why are we getting this symptom? And uh, there's been, uh, I've introduced a few of the patterns uh, about how you can go about addressing these things. Obviously, it's uh, 900 pages. You're not going to get uh, more than 10% of it covered off in a short presentation like this. But uh, give you something to start looking for when you're reading test code or running your tests. And a uh, very simple recipe for being successful is to start off by writing some tests. Start with some easy ones. Don't start with legacy code. That's the hardest kind of test code or production code to test. Um, why do you think I have all this gray hair? So I'm trying to test legacy systems. As you write tests, look at your tests. Note what test smells you discover. Run your tests, note what uh, behavior smells you might see. Ask yourself, how can I refactor this test code to make it simpler, easier to understand, or avoid some of these behavior smells? Apply the appropriate patterns that, uh, that address those particular smells. And then write some more tests. And continue, and just constantly strive to make your tests better. And that should get you a good set of automated tests that are repeatable, robust, et cetera. The other thing to be note is you have to be pragmatic. You're not going to get rid of all the smells. Sometimes you're going to have some smells. Ask yourself, what is it costing me to have the smell present? Can I live with it? Is this the most important smell to, to work at removing? How much it will it cost to, to remove? And sometimes you're just going to leave them there and say, not the most important thing to deal with right now. Otherwise, you can get sort of jammed trying to deal with this one test with this one smell. And you could be doing 10 other tests instead of working on this one. So what does it take to be successful? 
you need some experience programming, you need some experience with XUnit, some testing. You also need to think about design for testability. And the nice thing about doing test-driven development is that you are building testability in as opposed to retrofitting it on after the fact. You want to remove your test smells, apply the appropriate test automation patterns, and just continue to have a fanatical attention to test maintainability because that's what it's really all about. And that should lead you to robust, maintainable, automated tests. And that's it. Now open up. Thank you. So open up the floor to questions. Yeah, hi. Um, you, you touched briefly on testing hard to test code, like uh, the multi-threaded uh, code example. And, and I agree with your story of separating up synchronous code and testing that separately as much as you can. But that sort of avoids the problem in that you still want to be able to test the parts that are still multi-threaded to make sure, for example, that your synchronization is right. Do you have any thoughts on how to test that last bit of code that's still on the grid? Okay, I'm going to try and repeat the question, highly paraphrased because that was a long question. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for having actually read parts of my book because uh, I didn't talk about that in this talk. So the uh, comment was that um, one of the ways to avoid hard to test code is to, um, and particularly synchronous code, in other words, where code where we're launching another process and making sure that it did some stuff, is to test the launching logic separate from the logic that runs in the other process uh, or thread. And that's, uh, that's just good unit testing practice to make sure that you break things down and test the concerns individually. Um, so the question was, do I have any thoughts on how you can go about actually testing the integration of these little pieces, assuming that the little pieces have already been tested independently, and there are actually some techniques for testing across threads. The biggest issue, of course, is that if you try and do an assertion um, in another thread, um, you won't actually catch it on the current thread when it fails. So that's the nasty surprise is that, especially if you're using mock objects which throw assertions, and you run those mock objects in that other thread, they can throw the assertions all they want and nothing will happen. There are some techniques in Java for how to catch assertions across or exceptions across different threads. Um, there's actually a section, I don't cover it in my book because um, my book's already too big. <laughs> but uh, I do remember some examples on how to deal with that in, the, in another book, um, which is called uh, Unit Testing with Java by Johannes Link, I think, is the, uh, the lead author. And he's got some good examples of how to catch exceptions across threads. And um, the other issue with testing that way is that as soon as you launch a thread from within a piece of code that's running from a test, you're going to have to wait because now you've got asynchronicity in your test and that introduces uh, a form of slowness in tests. And so all of a sudden you're going from tests that will run in milliseconds to tests where you may have to wait one or two real full seconds. And so you don't want to run those tests in your unit test suite. You want to separate them out into a test suite that you run less frequently because you're not going to want to wait for 100 tests that each delay for two seconds uh, because now all of a sudden you have a test suite that takes minutes to run instead of seconds to run. So that's another consideration. And I hope that satisfies your... The biggest your problem would be the non-determinism. Well, yeah, the non-determinism uh, that... Um, that is introduced by having the asynchronous code is normally addressed by putting a long enough delay in to handle the worst case. And that's the problem is that to make the delay long enough to make it deterministic makes your tests really slow. And the reason why we want to try and avoid those types of tests in a unit test. Um, I have a question on the uh, functional testing or system testing versus unit testing. I've seen a, 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 a common failure mode of functional testing much of it. Um, and I've seen the argument that uh, perhaps the properties of a functional testing tool is just lightly happy path to everything. I was curious if you had any on that. Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, so how much functional testing do you need to do uh, relative to unit testing? And the two approaches are do lots of functional testing or to do a, the bare minimum automated functional testing uh, supported by a large amount of unit testing. Uh, hopefully that, uh, that uh, summarizes your question. Um, just the other day, actually, I heard Mike Cohn talking about this, and 
uh, his comment was, you want to think in terms of a test automation pyramid. And the pyramid, the base of the pyramid is your unit test. And so you have a very broad, extensive set of small unit tests that test individual li little bits of logic. And then the very point of the pyramid is a small number of functional tests that verify that the integration between all the software has been done correctly. And you don't really want to try and test all the logic in the system through the functional tests. That really should be tested by the appropriate unit tests. In between, you might have a smaller layer of component tests that maybe are testing some of the business logic components. And in my experience, that's an area where we often use FIT to, to test a component that contains all the business logic and test it in business terms so that we don't have to you know, tr trust you know, the translation from business terms into technical terms you know, having to be done, but rather we have the business people involved who, are, who can say, yes, this is the, the right way to describe the problem. They're actually writing those FIT tests themselves. And so you have this large number of thousands of unit tests you know, tens or hundreds of, uh, of fit tests and just a few, you know, half a dozen, dozen, whatever's the minimum number you can get away with functional tests that focus on integration of things as opposed to testing the logic thoroughly. That's my strategy anyway. Any other questions? Well, those are two very good questions. Well, ultimately, the, the challenge with testing asynchronous callbacks is that there's two things really. One is, does the callback code behave correctly? And the other is, is the callback being done at all? And you can actually, if you think in terms of breaking that apart, and doing, um, doing the testing of those independently, you can use uh, different mixes of what part of this sort of relationship between the original code, code that set up the callback, the thread that is doing the callback, and the code that is being called back. You want to, again, this is the same sort of asynchronous problem that we talked about earlier, and the idea is you want to try and test each of those independently. And depending on which piece you're, you're testing, the which piece of software is actually being replaced by the test and which part of that triad is being replaced by some kind of test double that verifies that the right calls are being made will be slightly different. So if you're testing the code that is, should be doing the callback, then you would have your test driving that code directly, not asynchronously, but in the, from the same process. And you'd be mocking out the actual called back logic with a mock object just to verify that, in fact, it is being called. So whatever method should have been called in the callback is what you'd be trying to mock out. And so that's just an example of sort of trying to sort of find what's the smallest piece of code I can test, because that's, that's what makes it a unit test. Michael Feathers has a really good little description in, in his book on legacy. I think he's got it in his legacy software book, but um, uh, I reproduced it in, in my book as a sidebar, which he calls a unit test rules. And if you, uh, if you Google that, you'll uh, see the five simple rules that he has. And, and one of the rules is if, it, if it's anything to do with a database, it's not a unit test. If it's anything asynchronous, it's not a unit test. If it involves a user interface, it's not a unit test, and so on. So it's like a set of sort of you know, violations of if it's any of these things, you, know, you want to think about how you can test it without doing these things. And it's a very, very practical way of forcing you to think about how to test less less code at the same time. You still want to test all the code, but just don't try and test it all at once. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming. Those are some great questions. and.